members of the, the session. Um, so we're going to talk about scene classification and object identification and complex LIDAR imagery. And this is myself and then co-author on the paper. Um, so here's table of contents. First thing we're going to do is just talk about our data. I'll introduce our data to you. Then we're going to talk about what machine learning is. And Abigail's going to do an overview of a couple of machine learning algorithms at a, at a high level. And then we'll talk about the classes and the features that we use for our test. And the machine learning algorithm that we're focusing on is a random forest. So I'm going to take the time to explain how to use a random forest properly and the things that a random forest algorithm can tell you about your data. Random forest is, is extremely useful. It's used in a couple of LIDAR papers to do classification. It's often used as a black box to get the best accuracy. But there's really a lot of stuff that goes under the hood that you can do to make your, your results more accurate and to get more information out of your data. So we're going to focus on that. And then we'll talk about uh, classification results. So here's our data. Data was LiDAR imagery collected over the uh, Rochester Institute of Technology campus. This is about a one kilometer by one kilometer area. We have about 18 million uh, points in our point cloud. And we gridded that to work with it um, in one meter by one meter grids. So typically a five to 20 points within each uh, grid cell about 1,000 by 1,000. And you can see the, the terrain here, higher level in the middle. This is an overlay of the, the max height for each grid cell. And then a lot of buildings. And then there's forest around the outside and a lot of the small objects, vehicles, and people that and lights that we want to try to identify as well. So then we're going to look at some different um, ways, different algorithms for machine learning. So this is a, um, a random, random grouping of, of data that we've set up. And the first one we're going to look at is Cambridge Neighbor. So what you do um, in this one, we have a new data point, and we want to figure out what class we should classify it as. So we look at its three nearest neighbors. And in this case, they're all green. So we classify it as green. Um, with this, this one, it's um, two nearest neighbors are blue. Um, there's a green one, but since a majority of them are blue, we're going to classify it as blue. So Cambridge Neighbor um, give you, it gives you a nice uh, line between your data to classify things, and it classifies them pretty, pretty well. Uh, you need a lot of data is one of the um, issues with this. So you need a lot of training data. And then our next one is linear discriminant data analysis. So with this one, you need um, normally distributed data. So what you do is you find the mean of your data, and then you find the, um, the distance out from where your data would be. And then you can find a new data point, and you can just see which mean it's closest to. And this gives you really accurate um, lines showing um, showing which class to classify your data as, but you do need normally distributed data. And then um, our, our this algorithm is a classification tree. So what you do with this one is you have your start and um, our data, and then you take a feature of your data, so in this case the roughness of it, and you have um, a decision. Is it bigger or smaller than A? And um, we're going to classify things that are bigger than A as, as vegetation, as green. And then we take another feature and we split the data again. And we get the cars and buildings um, classifications. So um, you'll see we have this, this dot here, which is green, but it's actually classified as blue. Uh, we don't really care if there's, if there's a point that's not in the right classification. We just want, kind of want to get the majority of points in the right one. Uh, but the problem is that our real data looks like this. So it's not quite as easy as that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a random forest. So um, for a random forest, what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a random subset of our, our data called in the bag sample, and the stuff left to back is the out of bag sample. Um, and then we're going to take a random a random um, account, a random bunch of our features, and we're going to make a tree. 
just like we did before. Um, and then because it's, we're going to make more trees, and because they're random, they're all going to be kind of different, have little different splits and different features. Uh, and then you do this a bunch of times, and you get um, something that kind of looks like that. But you get um, different trees, and then what you'll do is you'll run your data through it, and then whatever your data gets classified most often as is what you'll classify your data as. Uh, so then these are the classes that we used. So this is the ground truth. And um, we have three types of vegetation. We have forest, landscape trees, and landscape bushes. Um, three types of buildings. So we have buildings, townhouses one, and townhouses two. Um, two lights, street lights, and tall lamps. Um, cars and people are also very similar. Um, and then roads, tur roads and sports turf. turf. Um, and again, those are, those are all pretty similar. So we're getting kind of down to the um, pretty nitpicky um, differences. Uh, so and that's the landscape bushes. It's kind of hard to see on the, on the other one. So if we look at a, um, this line going across our data, and then we have plotted the later data for, um, for it, and we have the max, and the mean, and the min heights, um, you can look and you can see where the building, the, the max and the mean are, are fairly the maximum mean and the men are all very, um, very similar. Um, where you can see the trees, the, the max and the men are, are quite different. So you can use this to kind of define what, what things are in your imagery. So now we'll talk about the features that we used for classification. So the way, the way the random forest works is you have a bunch of features, and you're going to look for features, and you're going to allow the algorithm to pick the features that are most useful, separ separating out your data and for threshold values. And so here's how we computed some features to put into the random forest. Uh, the first step we did is do a building mask and remove the buildings to build a dem. So to build a building mask, we computed a Laplacian, which is the, the derivative in the spatial direction at each point. And you could see high derivative places tend to be edges of buildings and as well as trees. And so we created an edges mask from that, which is places where this is above three meters or so to threshold to get something where you expect the building edge would be. And we computed a roughness. Roughness is a standard feature in, in LIDAR classification. It's the max height minus the min height. It's something that's good for identifying vegetation. And then we did a building mask by doing a flood fill algorithm that filled in inside of the edges, and then when you filled in an area and it exceeded a certain minimum area that you'd expect a building rooftop to have, and it had a low roughness level, the average over that area, it was called a building. Then we masked out the buildings and computed a dem to get the ground terrain. And we subtracted that off the image to get uh, uh, the rest of our features. So this is the minimum LIDAR height after subtracting off the dem. This is the mean height and the max height. And then there is a local min. We took mean, max, and min, and we average them over sp in the spatial direction, so three by three and then five by five windows. Then we added a local standard deviation in the spatial area to look for areas that had a lot of fluctuation. And instead of having just a roughness mean minus max, we did some roughness ratios. OK, and so here's random forest optimization. And really, if you're interested in random forest, there's a Microsoft paper on random forest it's, that's excellent. It's the best exposition of random forest that, that I know of. Here's another paper, um, which actually I've got a, a copy of. Do we need hundreds of classifiers to solve real-world classification problems? So they took 179 classification algorithms in a lot of standard software, Python, R, MATLAB, 17 different families, and they ran them against 121 different data sets. This is a really nice what algorithms perform the best on average. And the results were, I guess the results were, the classifiers that are most likely to be the best are random forest. And then if you look at their top 10, the red are the random forests, green are support vector machines, and then there's neural nets as well that appeared on the, in the top 10. So random forest, if you're looking for something that's useful for somebody that's not an expert in that field, random forest is really at the top of the list for, for what, what should be recommended. Neural nets can be um, extremely accurate in some, some areas. We hear a lot about deep learning and neural nets coming out. But um, those are good if people for specific tasks, and particularly if people have a lot of experience in it. 
So to build a random forest, there's a small number of features you have to pick. And so the number of trees in your forest, remember a random forest is, I'm going to build a number of decision trees. Each of them are going to have some random selection to make them all different, hence the name random forest. It's a bunch of trees. So we have to pick the number of trees, the number of features that we're going to select to build each tree. When you build the tree, if you saw whenever you built the single decision tree, usually you stop and you say, if there's only one point that's misclassified, I'm going to ignore it because I'm going to overtrain if I try to split over little minor things. Random forest, you tend to split even if you have one individual thing and let the randomness avoid the overtraining. And then there's a splitting criteria. You can use a Gini index or entropy, and we picked Gini index. So there's not a big difference between those. So to tune your parameters, usually you just test the different parameter values and see what works the best. So pretty, pretty straightforward. So this is a plot on the x-axis. We have the number of trees in the random forest. We've computed 500 different random forests with different numbers of trees. This is the outer bag error rate. So when you compute each tree in your random forest, you use some of the samples to build the tree, and you, re you hold back what's called the outer bag samples. And then you can run those through the tree and compute your error rate as you're building the random forest. So that's a, a nice advantage to random forest. It's self-tests. And so we figured out about 250 trees. Uh, we don't expect much improvement after that. I mean, there's a little improvement here, but there's a, there's a trade-off with complexity and time running. So 250 trees seem to be a good place to pick. The next criteria you have to pick, and this one, this one is a little trickier to pick, uh, number of features, which is 11. There's a standard recommendation that you take the square root of the total number of features, which would give us about five. Uh, so, but again, it's not hard to, hard to pick your value. You just test. So I, we built a number of random forests um, going out to 250 trees. And this is each of these is a different plot with a different number of features. You see the recommendation is here. We get lower error with a bunch of things that centered around 11. And the teal here in the bottom turned out to be the best. So we picked 11, but 10 or 12 would probably work fine. There's this question, it's a theoretical question that gets often debated about random forests. The original paper said you should build your trees and segment all the way down to the end as far as you can and do splits until you have pure nodes at the bottom. Other papers have said, no, theoretically, you can justify stopping earlier. In our example, we tested stopping earlier at 10 or 20 misclassified um, uh, data points versus the red, which was build them out fully. So we, we picked that, so build out the trees fully. One of the nice thing in a random forest is that you get decision trees that'll tell you something about your data and you can see what it's doing. So this is one of the decision trees from the rain of forest. So this looked at a local mean height. If your local mean height is less than 1.3 meters, your data gets assigned to that side. If it's greater than that, your data gets assigned here. Then there's a split based on roughness. So if your roughness is less than a half a meter, you get assigned to this group. If your roughness is bigger than half a meter, you get assigned to that group. And then there's a split on whether you're in the building mask or not in the building mask. And so we can look at what classes tend to get sent down each of these paths. And the, the full tree has like 50 levels. We're only showing the first two levels here. But if we looked at all the data points that wind up at this level, there is sports, turf, and roads are, are what tends to get put down there. And they make sense because they have a small local mean height and a low roughness. So things that are short and not rough. Here we get a lot of the cars and people, so those things that are not very tall, but still have a lot of roughness within the, the grid cells. Here we get things that have a high roughness level, um, sorry, have a high height and are in the building mask, so they tend to be our different classes of buildings. So one of the goals in this paper was to say, can we separate out this, this specific, these very general buildings versus these two specific student housing buildings? And then here's all of our vegetation tends to wind up in this, not in the building mask, but tall class, and, and lights. So we could look at another decision tree. And if you look at this, there's a completely different set of features here that get selected. And if you're looking at random forest and you're saying, is my random forest working? That's the kind of thing you want. You want to see different features get selected. And we still get this pretty good breakout in these different classes at this level that are, that are distinct from each other. So that's a good thing in checking a random forest. If we look at our scatter plot, Here's some of our thresholds. Up here is where we wind up seeing our, our vegetation and tall lights. Over here is where we wind up seeing our, our buildings. Over there is where we see a lot of our sports turf and our roads. 
and here's where we see the cars and the people. So this is the same features we have in that first tree, or in the second tree, but shown on a scatter plot. Another very useful thing you get from a random forest is this feature importance. Each time a split is made over one of these features, you can say how much did it help things, and so you can see these are my really good features. These features aren't very useful. In fact, I might throw some of those features out and rerun everything. So you can throw in a lot of features. It may or may not be helpful in a random forest. Look at the feature importance and throw out most of the ones that turned out to be useful. I mean, not useful. Classification results. Here's the results. Random forest was the most accurate, as we expected. Linear discriminant analysis was inaccurate because it assumes normal distribution for your data. LIDAR is not normally distributed. K-nearest neighbors can get about as accurate as a random forest, but it takes a lot of training data to reach the, the accuracy of the random forest. And single decision tree did OK. So we can look at what things classified well. Landscape trees, not so good. Most of them actually got called forest. That's pretty reasonable. Is a lot of the, what we call landscape trees in our ground data, that ground truth data, really are indistinguishable from forest. People, all the people got called cars. So that's not very good if you care about people, finding people. That really has more to do with how things were set up. If we really wanted to find people, there's only about 50 people. Abigail did the ground truth. There's 50 pixels that were, we could find of people and like 40,000 on cars. So just the way the algorithm optimizes to get best overall accuracy on average, they called them all cars. So there's ways you could replicate the people data to, to artificially boost up those numbers and find out if you could get more, more accuracy. So this is a visualization. I don't know if the if you how you can well you can see that in the lights. But so this is the campus. This is Abigail built this in Blender. Buildings are colored purple. These are two different types of student housing that we were very able accurately able to sec separate out. Cars are in light blue. Sports fields are in this yellow. This is sports field that wasn't in our ground truth class, but got labeled yellow. So that was kind of nice to see. The road got got called red and. See, we have a fly through, so you can see the see the area. So those are the townhouses that get separated out as different types of buildings. This is a parking lot with a lot of individual cars that get separated out nicely. These are a lot of the landscaping trees and bushes which got separated out from the forest, which was which was good to see. And then more parking lots, sports fields. And these were landscaping trees, but they got called forest, which probably based on the size, probably we could have said big tree, little tree bushes, or something like that. Would have been better labels. Excellent. Thank you very much.